Well, good evening and welcome to the live show on the 2nd of November 2021. Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Great to have you on board. Thanks for spending some of your Tuesday evening with us. And uh, today it's just me, no guests, but we're going to go through a lot of data relating specifically to some of the news from the Reserve Bank today. We'll also look at some of the mortgage stress data and some of the broader economic data and try and sort of read what's going on and what may be going ahead. Um, as with all of these things, it's extremely complicated because there are so many moving parts. But um, as with all of these things also, it's worth it exploring, I think, a few of the uh, different options and scenarios and see whether we can make a, any sense of it. So um, without further ado, we might... Um, uh, that's my... <laughs> few people didn't like the photograph. I thought it was better than the previous one, but there you go. Um, so just in terms of the running order, uh, we'll do this introduction, just cover the house rules, uh, talk about our models a bit, some key slides, but the bulk of it will be questions and answers, and then we'll sign off about an hour and a half. And I do have the postcode engine online if you'd like to ask a postcode specific question. Just in terms of house rules, as always, I just remind you we don't provide financial or indeed legal advice on the channel. It's general conversation, based on my opinion. Uh, play nice in the chat room, please. We do moderate the stream. 2nd of November is the date. Use that walk the world to get my attention. It's very important because there's always plenty of stuff going on in the chat. I encourage it, but I don't necessarily follow all of the conversations. I have enabled Super Chat, which means you can get a question at the top of the queue or indeed make a contribution to help us uh, keep the show alive. And uh, just in terms of uh, some introductory comments, uh, those of you who have not been on the show before may not know that I run surveys. Those surveys feed into my core market model and that core market model then determines a lot of the modelling that I do subsequent. And uh, with that view, we can slice and dice the data all sorts of different ways. And we can also then put it into our scenarios and talk about what the implications may be. So I will talk about scenarios a little later on as well. And those scenarios are based on mortgage stress data, the price trajectory data, the buying and selling intentions, the migration data, CPI, other economic data, into the core market model through our different scenarios. And that then allows us then to look at information down to a postcode level or whatever. And we also do, of course, have these conversations one on one with people if they like to go into a deep dive on around a particular suburb. Uh, we're still running them. Uh, we've got uh, quite a lot of uh, people in the pipeline. It's not financial advice, but it is quite detailed information about a particular suburb or postcode. And we can talk about some of the stress, some of the trends, and even some views as to where pricing may go. It's just an opinion. It may change. But uh, that's something which um, people quite value, I think, in the current environment. Very uncertain, of course, at the moment. And uh, you can also um, book up to an hour's time to converse with me about that and also issues surrounding it. Um, there is a fee involved if you're interested in signing up and to contact me. Uh, contact me via the DFA blog. We're running, booking about three to five weeks out at the moment. Now, I wanted to pick you this quote. This is actually quite a nice quote. This is actually from um, um, John Arthur's uh, from Bloomberg. Uh, Larry MacDonald argues persuasively in the Bear Traps report, what we have here, ladies and gentlemen, is a consumer buying panic. We lived through this movie before in the 1970s and early 1980s. It isn't pretty. The buying panic creates an inflationary nightmare for short-term treasuries. It also creates great short-term earnings. So short-term rates spike and companies with positive guidance rally. But eventually the economy collapses, longer rate yield inversions and stocks get crushed. Now, I think that's a very nice little summary of where we actually are at the moment. And uh, what I want to try and do is um, go through some of the sort of the, the data that perhaps will help to build out why we think that's the case. Let me just acknowledge uh, um, a few uh, comments just as we go through here, because um, um, Smooth, thank you very much for your uh, uh, super chat. Really appreciate it. And uh, hey, another one. Thank you very much. And also to um, um, AJ as well. Thank you very much. It's uh, Great to have those super chat uh, contributions. Really um, well appreciated. Thank you. Now, um, let's then go and have a look at some of that more detailed uh, data. And uh, I'll flick back to the screen there and we'll go on with the conversation. 
Um, this is, um, of course, something you'll be aware of. We've basically had a bond market revolt. The RBA basically walked away from um, the uh, yield curve control, and I'll come into that a bit more. Uh, and we had a very significant run-up. <laughs> and this sort of uh, run-up felt a bit like crypto land to me, you know, very significant rise in terms of uh, massive spike. Uh, and of course, things have settled slightly, but not dramatically since then. And just to give you a sense of that, this was the interbank cash rate futures on the 1st of November. And you can see there that uh, March 23 was sitting at 1.35. That was before the RBA announcement today. And then a day later, the March was at 1.25. In fact, um, just to be clear, we moved on a month, which is why the uh, chart moved slightly. But that's the one to look at. So in fact, rates have come back slightly, but they're still way, way above the official cash rate. So there is still significant market expectation of rate rise pressure ahead. And uh, I have to say that I think uh, a lot of the commentators that I'm reading are not actually fully understanding just how strong those market forces are. And so to an extent, I think the RBA is still behind the eight ball. And you'll see what I mean by that as we continue the conversation. Now, one of the interesting things was the credit aggregate data that came out. Housing growth of 6.46% over the last year. With that, own occupiers at 8.68, so a massive growth from way up to where it was in 2016. And investment lending also a little stronger at 2.42, quite significant growth. There was uh, a little um, correction in personal credit, but still negative, and business credit is somewhat up. So that's about the only good sign. But look, this is all about housing credit, right? housing credit is driving what's going on here and that's really important to understand in the context of rising rates. Now one of the really interesting pieces of data that came out uh, yesterday was the new loan originations. This is from the ABS data and uh, this shows the breakdown between the total owner occupied excluding refinancing and investor excluding refinancing and what's interesting about that is that you can see there that the owner-occupied commitments fell. It's actually fallen for the fourth month. It's still higher than it was a year ago and 49% higher than pre-COVID levels in February 2020. The reason? Interest rates are so low. But this is very significant. This is actually showing that there's now an easing of momentum. So maybe we've seen the maximum when it comes to momentum in the lending. We'll see. And of course, if rates do rise, that's going to definitely put a dampener on things. Um, some of the uh, reports have suggested that um, the APRA changes to the buffer rate will on average reduce high leverage loans by about uh, 5%, simply because they won't be able to borrow as much. That's probably about right. Some people, of course, don't borrow as much as that. But Then if we go to the next uh, part of the storyline, this is another significant piece of data, which um, shows that the average loan size for owner-occupier dwellings has just gone through the roof. If you look at the momentum there, um, pretty much across the board, but uh, New South Wales in particular, you can see it's gone very, very high. And that, of course, is worrying insofar that now people are more exposed to the rising interest rates. And this is the other piece of data. I put a tweet out earlier today highlighting it. The latest data from the RBA shows that the ratio of owner-occupier housing debt to analysed household income is 102.1. That's the highest it's ever been. And whilst everyone's saying, well, you know, that's OK because rates are really, really low. Um, yeah, well, the question is, will rates stay really, really low? We've got huge leverage in the system. And, uh, you know, one of the things I'm worried about is simply the amount of leverage we have and what happens when rates go up. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that we are going to see more and more pressure on households. And as I'll show you later, that pressure is already happening to households now. And so it's not like we're starting from a low base of pressure, low base of stress. We've got a very high stress levels before we start. And now we're going to see significant rises. 
The other point to make there is the first time buyer loans continue to ease away. Down again, New South Wales fell 3.1%. Um, New South Wales uh, there, but Victoria even worse at 17%. Western Australia did have a bit of a spike. Queensland has a bit of a spike too. But net net, you can see there that the first time buy momentum is certainly easing as well. And that I think is partly a contrary contribution to the fact that the overall ability to borrow is tightening. Banks are actually being a bit more tight uh, with their lending criteria now. The other interesting thing, this is came from CanStar today, and they surveyed households and they said well, nearly a third of Australians are in favour of higher interest rates as a measure to cool the property market, according to new research. It's quite a small survey, 1,280 Australians. But as they said, this is just the start of the increases. For residential borrower on a $500,000 loan, on average, um, a 0.25% rise would be a repayment of somewhere increasing of 68 to uh, $2,206, depending on where you looked. But if you look at it for a million dollar mortgage and the 1% rise, then you're talking at somewhere between $560 and $4,826 a month which is quite a stretch. So that's the problem that we've now got in the system. And of course the likelihood is we are going to see more rate rises, it's just a question of when. Also just in passing I'll highlight the fact that the PMI was pretty weak again, eased by 0.8% to 50.4 points. Um, not really what we wanted to see so the economics are looking pretty weak. And the inflation expectations has risen as well. This is from Roy Morgan. So 4.8% annually over the next two years, up 0.3%. Expectations the highest for seven years since November of 2014. And, um, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, inflation, that means I'm going to need more wage rises. <laughs> so we may well start to see this sort of circling round of uh, wage rises, chasing inflation, chasing wage rises. Now, the RBA today um, basically said that they're going to maintain their cash rate target of 10 basis points and the exchange rate settlement balance at 0%, continue to purchase government securities at the rate of $4 billion a week until at least February, so they're still doing QE. So these are dovish signs, uh, but discontinue the target of the 10 basis points for the April 2024 Aussie bond. Now, of course, they've had no choice because they've basically been uh, taken to the cleaners by the market. And they said that we're uh, seeing a recovery and the central forecast for GDP is 3%, 21, 5.5% and 2.5% over the following two years. So a bit of a spike back and then settling back. Uh, the setback could continue because of the health front, of course, they say. And then they said the Delta outbreak caused hours work to fall sharply, but there's a bounce back underway. The central forecast for unemployment is to reach four and a quarter percent at the end of 2022 and four percent by the end of 2023. Now I'd be quite interested to know what their migration assumption was there. So are they assuming they were going to get a large migration in? Because of course one of the things that uh, Philip Lowe said previously was that migration was one of the reasons, high migration was one of the reasons why wages growth was so low. So it will be interesting to see how that plays out. And then they said inflation has picked up but underlying it's still low at 2.1%. Headline is three. Central's forecast for underlying inflation is around 2.25% over 21 and 22 and 2.5% over 23. Wages are expected to pick up gradually as the labour market tightens, with wage prices forecast to increase by 2.5% over 2022 and 3% over 2023. OK, so in fact, still somewhat below inflation. So no real wages growth. Maybe if you're lucky, mirroring inflation is what they're saying. And then they went on to say house pricing is continuing to rise. They welcome the APRA's decision. Hang on a moment. The RBA and APRA was part of the Council of Financial Regulators who made the decision. So the bank is welcoming itself. <laughs> that makes no sense to me um, on the serviceability buffer improvement. The financial conditions remain highly accommodative. Exchange rates appreciate a little but remains in the range. Over the past year, they'd like it lower, of course. 
decision to discontinue the target yield reflects the improvement in the economy. So they're now basically justifying the fact they got beaten by the market, by the economy is improving. Earlier than expected progress towards inflation target. Given that other market interest rates have moved in response to the likelihood of higher inflation and lower unemployment, the effectiveness of the yield target in holding down the general structure of interest rates has diminished. <laughs> what they didn't say, but they should have said was, OK, we give up, the market's won. But of course they can't say that, can they? They have to give the impression of knowing what they're doing. Uh, the board's committed to maintaining highly supportive monetary conditions. While inflation's picked up, it remains low in underlying terms. And it's interesting, they're trying to draw a distinction here between inflation pressures uh, here compared with many other countries, not least because of modest wages growth in Australia. Uh, we'll see about that. And so they basically said, we won't increase the cash rate until actual inflation is sustainable within 2 to 3%. This is likely to take some time. We're prepared to be patient and basically... They're talking perhaps now 2023, but of course they're not giving a particular target now, whereas previously they did. So they've gone all loosey-goosey, information dependent or fuzzy dependent, basically. So to my mind, this really just shows that the uh, RBA has pretty much uh, lost control of what it was trying to do. No great surprise, but there you go. And it's just worth noting, this is actually the... Um, uh, foreign exchange Aussie dollar US dollar and at the point when the announcement was made um, it dropped significantly it did come back a little bit but it is interesting that there was a market reaction to the announcement the Reserve Bank made now let me move on then to mortgage stress and um, as I do let me just always come back to a definitional point so when we talk about mortgage stress it's very important to understand what we're talking about this is based on my modeling as i said earlier on and we're looking at cash flow money in money out we're looking at how households are coping with all their commitments and all the money coming into the household from all sources so if they're underwater in terms of cash flow they're classified as stress that may doesn't mean that they're going to default tomorrow but it, what it does mean is that they're going to have to pull down on their savings or pull down on credit cards or get more loans or pull down on equity to keep going. And if they keep doing the same, eventually the equity diminishes and the uh, financial situation that people get into deteriorates. And over the medium term, unless they change the behaviour, financial stress follows that leads ultimately to then having to sell the property, all those sorts of things. And we have a definition for rental stress as well, where people are handling rents rather than paying mortgages. Similar philosophy. We also have an investor stress def definition, which is a bit different because there we are taking into account negative yields in net terms on the property or trying to sell it and not being able to sell it or trying to let it and not being able to let it. Uh, all of those factors in there. And then we have an overall financial stress which is an aggregate measure of the total for the whole household for each postcode. So that's how we do it. And um, you know, there's a lot of um, shenanigans on Twitter recently about um, the stress and how it's done. And you know, the media pick it up quite often, particularly now, by the way. I expect to see some more um, press coverage in the next few days. Uh, but people um, can't get their head around what I'm doing. I'm doing it differently. It's not defaults. Okay? It's not the same as the way that banks measure the 90-day default rates. It's also a model, but it's a different number. And this is a different measure. But it's a very important leading indicator, and it shows you quite a lot about what's going on. And so that, with that introduction, let me then show you the overall trend. So this is the mortgage stress for October. It's come back just a little. So basically, we were at 42 and a bit. We're now at 41 and a bit um, since last month. And that's partly because a few more people have come back to work. More people have been able to refinance their mortgages to a lower rate. And uh, because more people are actually um, now also receiving or were receiving some government payments because of COVID, that also helps a little bit. Of course, some of that will unwind now. But this is the other interesting point. The household debt ratio. So this is the total debt ratio that includes SMEs. It includes all businesses and uh, all households is 183.8. Significant spike up. So again, you're seeing in the underlying data, credit is continuing and the debt to ratio between the credit and the household uh, income is high again. So that indicates more pressure. What I can then do is look at the 
real data. This is the previous one, and then we'll jump to the October data. And what I've done is I've highlighted in yellow where things have gone up. So if you look at the ACT, in fact, all of the stress metrics deteriorated in the ACT over the last month. That's a function probably of the lockdown more than anything else. Uh, and it's still lower than some other states, but it's quite significant. So about half of households are in some difficulty. In fact, that 50% metric is some um, quite a lot higher than some other post uh, some other states. So that's um, something to bear in mind. And of course, it's interesting because people always think of the ACT as a really wealthy um, sort of sector of the economy. But under the waterline, there are some financial issues. If you look at New South Wales, there was a little bit of improvement. That's partly to do with some of the uh, unlocking. It's partly to do with some of the other factors that I mentioned earlier on. NT's deteriorated. Queensland's deteriorated. South Australia's a bit up and down. Mortgage stress higher. Rental stress a little lower. Investor stress not so strong. Tasmania, significant rise again. Um, I keep looking at Tasmania thinking, how much worse is it going to get? Because the Tasmanian economy is meant to be the best, most buoyant, according to CBA. But there are a lot of people really under pressure. Victoria, down a little, but still very high. 43% of households in uh, mortgage stress, um, just behind the NT at 44%. And then WA, a slight improvement, down to 41%. So the overall is 41.4% for mortgage stress, 40% for rental stress, 25.6% for investor stress, and the overall financial stress metric is there is 39%. So that's pretty high, and that's really just highlighting that the whole question of what's going on is not really being fully understood by many of the politicians, or prefer they, maybe they prefer to look away. Households, a lot of households, are in a bind at the moment. They've got pressures and some of those pressures are coming from higher cost of living fuel costs of course have risen the real cpi number is a lot higher than the one that is um, officially uh, forecast of course uh, real incomes have not happened growth has not happened at all a lot of people have also lost hours and um, they've had some small support from governments in some cases with even so it's pretty difficult so the question now from here will be whether in fact the mortgage stress starts to ease down but then, of course, now we've got this um, sequence of higher rents probably down the track. Now, we can also look at this by segment. I'm not going to go through this in detail because it's not a hugely different story, but it's worth highlighting that young growing families, including first-time buyers, 75% of them are under difficulty. A lot of people have got very big mortgages up to their gills in, in um, mortgage, and uh, their incomes are not necessarily um, keeping track with it. Um, so that's a pretty worrying number. And then we've got the um, battling urban and the disadvantaged fringe, both of whom have significant issues. We also have, of course, other segments. Young growing families, uh, I've mentioned, they're the ones at the top. But even young affluents, some of them are not doing that well. Quite a small number with mortgage stress, but if you look at the rental stress, a lot of those are actually um, struggling. So a lot of them have got investment properties that are not performing. A lot of those investment properties are high-rise properties, and they're either vacant or they're actually having to give away um, uh, lower cheap, uh, lower cheaper tenancies. And um, if you look at the investment uh, perspective, it's translated through. So investors are finding that uh, they have to actually um, you know, forego some income simply because of the fact that there's a high proportion of people who are actually struggling. And I'll just highlight also that our exclusive professionals, those more affluent right at the top of the market, some of those are also highly leveraged. They've got multiple properties. They've got uh, investment properties. They've got a lot of assets, of course, which they can probably unwind. But in cash flow terms, they're finding it quite difficult too. So wherever you look, you can see the patchwork quilt effect and then they're just going through this quickly in terms of the locations. This has become clearer and clearer now as uh, things progress. So if you look at the top postcodes, Victoria, Narrow Warren, um, Victoria, uh, Berwick and Harkaway, uh, Hopper's Crossing, um, Clarkson, Tawanda Park, Western Australia, Sydenham. So it goes on. So the first four or five there, you'd all say... All of those are high growth, 
high development areas where they've still been building and are still building quite a lot of new properties. A lot of new people have come into the area. So the high growth areas are where the highest number, and this is on number, not percentage, highest number of households in difficulty. So that's partly a function of the fact there are a lot of uh, households there with a lot of um, uh, big footprints in terms of just count, but also a lot of highly leveraged people. As you go down the list, you can pretty much see some of the flavours. We've also got some regional areas like Ballarat, Tamworth. They're still uh, also feeling the pain as well. Um, unfortunately, we're seeing it getting just more and more ground in. Now, if we then look at the rental stress, it's a bit different. Uh, to some different um, areas. Some of the regional areas um, are, are finding it difficult, like uh, up mid north coast. Um, Central Coast, I should say, uh, West Gosford. Um, then we've got Greystains and Bondi Beach. A lot of those are actually um, the Bondi Beach ones are the old um, high rise, uh, uh, which rents are <laughs> actually a lot of people are finding it quite difficult to get rents paid there at the moment, which is uh, no surprise from what I'm seeing. Wollongong's on the list, Surrey Hills, and then we go up to Queensland and you know. Labrador or places like that. So some of the uh, rental properties up in Queensland, um, because they've been able to put the rents up, is definitely creating an issue too. And you can see there that some of those have significant numbers of households. And then if we quickly look through to investor stress, a little bit different, but Westmead, places like that, um, up on the Queensland coast, uh, Mandra, um, St Kilda, um, and then so it goes on other areas in Queensland it's quite interesting how a number of Queensland areas are actually struggling now fascinating of course because the rental returns are meant to be better in Queensland but we're also seeing now more of them finding it hard to uh, get the rents they need and then we've got places like Lane Cove and Surrey Hill and then ACT and then DY and on it goes so that gives you a bit of a flavour as to some of the hot spots um, and I will just show you the financial stress one because that's the aggregate measure. So this is the total financial stress data. And you can see there, well, some of the similar ones. Narrawarra and Cranbourne, South Tamworth, Blacktown, Belbridge Park, Ballarat, Little Mountain. Um, some similar stories there with regards to the high growth corridors, some regional areas. Uh, so it's a complex patchwork. And one of the things I keep saying to people is don't just take it up to a high level and sort of try aggregate. You've got to go down into granularity here to see what's really going on. OK, let me now then turn to the stress mapping because that's something else that we can definitely uh, uh, chat about. And to do that, I'm just going to switch across to here. So this is my uh, mapping tool now. And what I've done here is I've started with Sydney. Um, I'm showing the percentage distribution. This is actually... Um, in percentage, so the 7% or below up to 90% and above. And you can see there that in and around Sydney, well, there's a couple like Woolara where there's a bit of issue. So as you go into oranges and reds, then it's high. Rydalmere. But if you then pull out, and you can start to see there in Western Sydney, the proportion of households who are actually in significant pressure is definitely aggregated in a few different areas. Blacktown there. Campbelltown, Liverpool, um, places like that. And in fact, if you go further out and further up, you can see how the footprint. So it's a lot of it's in Western Sydney. And a lot of those are in the high growth corridors. And it goes up towards North Ryde and places around there as well. Um, so that's uh, pretty typical of what we've been seeing in previous times. But it does really tell the story again. And if you pull out slightly further you can see that the um, story is pretty obvious there. Even places like Hornsby and places right there are also on the list as well. Now, if I then go to another postcode, let's go to 3000. OK, and so what we're doing now is starting in the centre of uh, Melbourne and starting to pull out. And once again, you can see the patchwork. Remember, I'm showing here percentages of postcodes. So if you've got a small household count that are actually stressed, 
you could have a high proportion even if the total number is not that strong. This is always a bit of a question when I show my maps because sometimes I show it in terms of accounts, sometimes I show it in terms of, in terms of percentages. But you can see there that we've got issues to the north of Melbourne, issues also to the east and towards Danalong and also to the west around Point Cook. So that's pretty standard and if you go out further you'll even see places like Ballarat also on the list as well. Um, so not a dramatic shift but it is interesting to continue to see these distributions in areas and I would make the point again as I've made before that if you actually were to map high COVID infection rates through the last three months there would be a very high correlation with high mortgage stress pools and that's partly because people were forced almost to go to work to try and pay the mortgage and uh, of course quite a lot of them were in jobs where they had to travel so that's part of the reason. Now if I then go across to let's go to Brisbane and just go there okay so Brisbane is not show um, in difficulty but there are the old hot spot like uh, Albion there 4010 getting a bit wobbly and interestingly as you pull out you start to see then the similar story where there are some hot spots and as you come away from the center of Brisbane you can see that uh, it's to the south 4106 some areas towards the coast as well but also now Ipswich and places like that are also on the list. So again, you can see in particular areas we have these hotspot zones where there is actually quite a lot going on. And in fact, if you move down towards uh, south of uh, towards the Gold Coast, you can see even down there there's a few interesting areas. It's not as dramatic as some others, but again, you can see some of these areas to the south and east of Brisbane where there is a bit of a problem as well as the Ipswich area and on it goes. And I will go over to Perth because Perth's quite an interesting area because everyone's been talking up Perth for a long long time the fact of the matter is that Perth is definitely um, easing back from where it was. We had a significant boom. A um, number of people bought, I think, right at the top of the boom, but we'll see. Sterling getting a bit wobbly. And as you pull out from the centre of Perth, you can start to see that, uh, as normal, towards the south and towards the north, uh, you've got a few of those hotter spots. Um, it's not dramatic, but it is enough to just be slightly concerning. And uh, again, I'm still seeing pockets of stress in and around Perth, particularly in some of those areas um, up north near Wanneroo and down south. And even places like uh, Mandarin, places like that, are still um, seeing some pressures. So that gives you a bit of a flavour. I will just quickly switch my maps and go to the rental stress because I run a similar... Um, run a similar one to that as well okay and we'll just start in Sydney because the rental stress is somewhat similar and if you pull out from the center of Sydney again looking at percentage terms you can start to see that there is actually some hot spots again uh, a lot of it's to do with high rise a lot of it's to do with people who are having great difficulty paying their um, rents um, Parramatta North Ride and uh, North Ride Units are down more than 26% now from where they were in 2017. So it's not all uphill in terms of price growth. And some other north, like Northbridge, North Sydney, um, places like that, North Bondi and Burwood. And if you pull out further, you sort of see the, um, the geography easing in. So somewhat similar. So somewhat similar correlation to mortgage stress with rental stress, which isn't surprising, it's the same characteristics of course there, but uh, I'd highlight that in fact the degree of stress in some of these Western Sydney areas are more significant. And if I then go to Hobart, just to 
complete story. Hardly similar numbers in terms of counts, but what I do see is just a little bit of activity, not a lot, a little bit that's um, growing around there. Um, so it's not coming through anything like as mortgage stresses in Hobart, despite the fact that a lot of people are having great difficulty. And then if I go to South Australia, just to give you a story there. So again, not too bad, but a few pockets. And once again, you can begin to see that there are a few areas where mortgage stress and indeed rental stress is showing up so tells you something if you're thinking of um, getting into rental properties it's worth understanding where the rental properties are actually behaving well and whether or not now i do have of course a uh, lot more map maps and things including uh, financial stress and um, investor stress but i'm going to cut to the map there because i think that's probably enough on the conversation with regard to the map so let me go back to my slides. Go back to there. Go back to there. Okay, now just let me briefly touch on the scenarios. Now the scenarios, this is a real problem, right? There's so much moving stuff going on. So I'm still working on the scenarios, but what I'll show you what I've done so far. Um, it's a guide, right? That's all it is. It's not saying it's it's completely right. But it is interesting. I've had to change the uh, RBA baseline. So I think by 24 to 36 months later, we're going to see an RBA rate of 1.5. I think the unemployment rate will still be relatively low. Mortgage stress was going to be higher than previously. And so I've now taken down the price growth expectations from plus 5 to minus 15. So if, in fact, if the RBA is right about prices rising and the rates rise, the end of QE and all those things, that's what we could be looking at. And, of course, some... Um, um, Christopher Joy said, if rates rise that amount, then we're going to see 20% um, fall. So interesting to see whether that's the case. 10%. My, my best case, this is my sort of what I think is most likely to happen. I think we're going to see a rate of about 1%. I think the unemployment rate will be about 4.8. Mortgage stress will be down from where it is, but not dramatically. There will be some losses. There is still some possibility of some growth in some areas, particularly houses, but not units. And there's a 50% chance. And then my other scenarios are in the if in fact we get a blow up, let's say Evergrande blows up, or let's say the um, financial markets um, you know, finally collapse, then these other scenarios, the negative scenarios, are still there. But you can see that my main scenario now is still in this sort of area between small rises and um, some slides over the next three years. So that's where I think... Uh, the weight of the argument currently sits but again this is an average it does vary by postcode it does vary by type of property and so really to understand what might be going on it's better to look at individual postcodes as we will do it a little bit later okay so with that um what i'm then going to do is just switch across to the postcode tool and i'll just um, answer a few of the postcode um, stories that people asked about and uh, I will just say that we've been doing quite a lot of work in the background on the tool it's working quite well now and um, this is just 2000 this is the one I had to start with um, just to show you the structure for those who've not seen it before so this is based on my survey so we look at the number of households those borrowing those renting the proportion in financial stress and then we look at the mortgage category, we look at the rental category, and we look at the overall investor category. So that's the way it works. Now, Janet asked me about 306, whoops, 3068 Fitzroy. There we go, 3068. So this is some 3068, Janet. And so there are 9,000 households in the postcode about 2,500 borrowing, about 5,000 renting. There's about 4,000 properties for rent, and there are around 3,000 property rental owners. The overall financial stress metric is 44%. 
Within that, mortgage stress is at 55%. That's very high. Anything over 40% is, is on the high side. And within that, you've got some severe stress as well, which means that people are severely underwater. There's a risk of default about sitting about 3% in the postcode. For rentals, about 30% are actually in rental stress. And for investors, we've got 39% um, of investors in the postcode struggling. And that they could be struggling with trying to let the property. They could be struggling with trying to get rents that's reasonable or indeed um, trying to sell the property. And we also have a bit of a go at what may happen. And so based on where we are today, what is likely to happen? So in my most bullish scenario, we could see property prices for houses maybe up 8% over three years. The neutral slightly down and the bearish case if we really get a, a you know a significant hit down about 10 percent units about six percent over three years or slightly below on our two other cases so at 44 percent it's worth being quite cautious about this postcode now i also got a request for 2259 so we'll put that one in Okay, so that's um, there. And there we've got 23,500 households. We've got nearly 10,000 borrowing, 8,000 renting, 6,700 properties for rent, and 7,300 rental property owners. Stress is at 50%. This is financial stress. Mortgage stress is at 40%. So of those, 3,900 have an issue. Default at 3%. 69% of renters having difficulty paying their rents and 28% of property investors are having issues. And over the next three years, best case for houses is up about 5.5% over three years. Worst case, down about 12% units. Best case, about 4% up. Or bearish case, down 9%. So that's where that one is. Okay, so I hope that is um, of use. What I'm now going to come back to is just have a look at some of the questions and uh, I'm sure there'll be some more postcode uh, questions coming through. So if there are, we will try and deal with some of them too. But uh, I'm also happy to take um, you know, broader questions and I've also got a little bit more information to share with you as well on the broader international macro as we go through the uh, situation. Um, all right, so let's see what we have in terms of questions. Um, and uh, nice to see some familiar faces and some new faces. So it's great to see everybody here. <laughs> yes, the dogs sound asleep now. Um, one Berger. Um, can we see the dogs? Well, they're asleep at the moment. I'll tell you what I should do. Um, next time, what I'll do is I'll rig up my camera so I can actually show the dogs asleep because I don't really want to wake them up because if I wake them up, they're going to be hellish noisy they are um, extremely noisy doggies now interesting question if the RBA raises the rate will banks profit with deposits no the what's happening at the moment is the bank's margins are really under under significant pressure very significant pressure and uh, thanks for that if I've not acknowledged I may have acknowledged that already actually but uh, You've got an extra acknowledgement. Thank you very much for that. All right, it's going down the list. <laughs> yes, now that's not a postcode request. That's just pointing and making the point that 2024, yeah, 2024 is going to come a lot closer. The question is how much closer? That's the unknown quantity. The RBA has gone very wobbly now. They're not basically saying much at all. Um, Unfortunately, rates will be going up and a lot sooner. And of course, even now, the banks are repricing. If you look at the fixed rates, they've already gone up. Um, senior Tech says RBA stuffed immigration was used to cover up the lower quality of life. Now it's gotten so bad they need wages growth, but they cannot do both. Cover it up and try to fix the problem. They will try to fix it. They will try. I wouldn't be surprised to see ultimately um, a weakness in the economy coming through, which means that we might see rates go up and then have to come back down again. They've really backed us into a corner, in my view, 
And as you say, the migration thing. And now it's interesting that Phil Lowe the other day said migration was a problem, right? And yet, of course, everyone's now talking about big Australia. And as Amit said, federal budget forecast 200,000 immigrants in 23 and 24. That's a lot of immigrants to put in the system. And interestingly, uh, Ross Gissings wrote an article today saying, just remember, supply is not the issue. There's plenty of property around. More people are getting on board with that argument that, in fact, the whole idea of just build more is unnecessary because we've got plenty of property. And even if you've got a migration of around 200,000, it doesn't actually need, mean you need a lot more. And interestingly, New Zealand, there was a report published during the week that also said the same, that we've actually got equilibrium between demand and supply. So understand the main reason why property prices are so high is low interest rates, very large mortgages, and that sort of vicious circle of people being sucked in. And people who have bought in the last year will be buying at the top of the market, which is a problem. Because there is a significant chance, as I showed you earlier, that prices might be sliding. Now, Master Singleton said, stress data for 2158. Yep, can do that. Let me just go and put the data in, and then I'll switch across. 2158. Five, eight. So that's like Dural. Dural, Dural, Dural. I don't know. <sighs> okay. So I'm going to take the chat off and I'll switch across there. There you go. So this is uh, 2158. If I can make it a bit bigger, just to make it a bit easier to see. There you go. Might help. Okay. Um, and just to, of course, remind you that you can subscribe to get all this data for every postcode in the country every month and I'll put some links at the end to show you how to do that. 3,000 households, 1,200 borrowing, 758 renting, 34% in financial stress, 22% in mortgage stress, that's 286, so it's not huge, but this is the interesting one. Rental stress is very, very high. A lot of people having difficulties paying those rents and as a result of that, investors are also finding it quite difficult, 33 and one third, um, of which 161 are severely stressed. Ahead, we're looking at about 5.6 bullish case, or down 12% bearish case for houses, and around 4% or down 9% for units over three years. So I hope that was of use. Um, and one of the things we've done uh, with the model is we've actually um, change the parameters. That there were a number of postcodes over the last couple of months people asked for that didn't show. The reason it didn't show was not because we didn't have data, but because we only had relatively small quantities of data, and the model basically decided that it was too small to be sure, so we didn't show it. Now we've changed that, so there'll be a little message uh, for postcodes with, with low counts. We'll still show the data because it's <laughs> we've actually got more data in the model than the Perhaps um, we um, uh, gave the impression of. Interesting comment from Cine uh, Tech. Yes, yeah, stress is high around three regional cinemas, and even though opening up attendance has never been as bad as it is now, expected as a bump as people could. But, yep, you're right. And we're seeing that in my surveys, right? A lot of people are really trapped at the moment. And interestingly, um, there's been quite a lot of booking of overseas flights and things and people wanted to get away for holidays. Um, so people are directing some spending to that. But a lot of people have no, no free cash. So they're putting it on credit cards and all sorts of things. So um, I expect to see personal debt rise quite significantly because of the reopening of the travel um, situation. And Vincent says real estate commercial RIT is going to get smashed. Correct. It's already happening. You see some of the, sh the, the price drops recently. People are not spending. I conclude they're all nervous. Yep, that's what I'm seeing in my surveys. Okay. And Vincent also referred to the Great Resignation. I did a show, uh, no, I did a, um, some research for um, a journal the other day and it actually went, went on to... Uh, one of the main newspapers and made the point that a lot of people thinking of moving, trying to get wages by moving from one place to another place. 
pretty much the only game in town is to <laughs> is to try and move and try and get a job increase. And interestingly, the Treasury and RBA research highlighted that moving jobs was one of the most significant catalysts to lifting income for those particular households. So I expect we're going to see a lot more of it. Interesting comment from um, BM. Given interest rates will increase in the next 12 months, driven by other countries rising cash rates, NZ banks raising variable rates, RBA raising cash rate, when do you expect house prices to decline? Well, I've given you a bit of a, a sense of that. Um, you know, aggregate level, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. You need to go granular. But essentially, in my scenarios, I'm suggesting that over the next two or three years, in some of my scenarios, there is very little growth from this point. So we may have seen pretty much peak prices. And in fact, I was talking to an agent today who's saying that the settlements now that are coming through are actually below what he was seeing two months ago. So maybe in some areas we're already seeing them come off. I think there will be still a little bit of... Um, flow over because there are still people chasing those properties and you know paying over the odds but I think the um, temperature is about to change quite dramatically okay what else have we got um, Matt says iron ore and coal, yep, continuing to slide down, of course. That's some significant factor. And, um, you know, China sort of reactivated its coal um, strategy to try and actually deal with the power shortages. Um, but uh, it doesn't actually mean that coal's going to start bouncing up. Um, and, of course, as those prices come back down, that's going to have a significant impact on our own economy here in terms of uh, well, imports and exports. Brendan says, have a look at Quakers Hill. 2763. I can do that. I'll put the, put the uh, query in first. 2763. Yep, Quakers Hill is there. Okay, I'm going to take that off and then switch that to there so you can see it. Okay, Quakers Hill. 75% oh, financial stress, uh, uh, red alert, 9,000, only 10,000 households, 6,000 borrowing, more than 3,000 renting, more than 2,500 or thereabouts properties for rent and nearly 3,000 property rental owners, 75%. And in terms of mortgage stress, 4,600 in mortgage stress. It's mild stress, which is something, 78%, which could default. 107 or 2 percent over the next 12 months rental stress is at 65 percent there 2100 investor stress not too bad at the moment at 24 percent but this is the um, one to watch as a result of that we're looking at a four percent uh, bullish price rise over the next three years or a bearish fall of 14 percent and for units a bullish of three and a bearish of 10 in that particular postcode and uh, again I think you'll find that these are some of the sort of the um, high growth areas um, one of the things I've seen quite often is that uh, people bought a uh, ho new homeland package and then down the road there are new homeland packages and suddenly the value of their property eased back as well we're seeing quite a lot of in some of those outlying areas as well Okay, other questions? Let's have a look. Smooth says, I'm renting, I'm renovating in Parramatta, and some agents are telling me 17 empty units on Early Street, Parramatta. Yep. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, there is a lot of controlled release of properties on the market from the agents in the high rise sector at the moment. Again, I've been talking to a few agents about that. And what they're doing is they're not putting them all on at the same time, but there's huge vacancies in a lot of these high-rise areas, especially those where there's been evidence of uh, poor quality construction. So that's something else to factor in. And, uh, you know, Edwin and I keep saying about make sure you do the checks and balances if you actually are going to go and um, look at property because uh, particularly high-rise property for purchase, there's a lot of pain there. And a lot of people are really being forced to sell. Okay, um, I've done that one. 
Um, I've got a Queensland postcode here. Let's just put the question up from Byron. Um, so four, five, five, six. Four, five, five, six. Okay. Four, five, five, six. Okay, four, five, five, six. Go across to there, get rid of the chat. There you go. 17,000 plus households, 7,000 borrowing, 7,000 renting, um, over 5,000 properties, over 6,000 property owners, and 32% in financial stress. So that's a lot lower than some of the other areas. 23% of mortgage stressed households. Some of those are um, being hit by the, uh, the COVID restrictions. 3% default, 36% for rentals, 2,500, 24% for investors, few severely stressed investors. And in terms of projections, we're looking at uh, positive 14% over the next three years if things go really well there. If they don't, down about 3 to 4%. For units, up 10% down 2.7%. So I've consistently seen stronger expectations of price growth in areas of Queensland than some other places. That's partly interstate demand. It's partly that prices are more reasonable relative to other parts of the country. And it's also partly the case that um, there's uh, not a vast amount of property on the market at the moment, although interesting listings, listings are certainly uh, rising. Okay, now let's see what else I've got in terms of another one. Uh, 2541 says Mars. Let's see if I can do that one. Two five four one. Uh, just a shout out to the uh, guys who maintain my model for me. Um, and the system. They've done a great job in updating the data each month and uh, making it all accessible to everybody. Um, so uh, shout out to them. Thank you very much. Okay, so 41% um, in financial stress. That's 11,500 pretty much. 3,500 borrowing, 5,400 renting, 4,000 properties, 3,900 rental property owners. And in terms of the stress levels, very low, 4%. Rental stress, more of an issue, 59%, 3,239, and 44% of investors. Now, of course, those two things are very much paired up, right? If you've got stressed renters, then you've got stressed investors. In terms of price predictions or estimations, they're not really a prediction, it's just sort of modelling, a 7% bullish case down to minus 11% bearish case for houses, units up 5 down 8.6. So you can see there's a pretty consistent pattern, houses outperforming units pretty much wherever you look in the model. And that's based on all the data that we've we've seen over recent times. Okay, let me see what else I've got. Uh, there's that one there. We might put that one up. 6069. Whoa. I think I need to get this keyboard cleaned. I've got a sticky zero. Okay, 6069. Let's just get shut off so you can see it. So that's um, Upper Swan, the Vines, places like that. 14,300 households, 10,400 borrowing, 4,500 renting, 3,300 properties for rent, 3,100 rental property owners in the area. 56% in financial stress. Mild stress is 4,700 at 45%. So that's pretty high. A little bit of severe stress. No, no severe stress, sorry. Um, a little bit of default, not a lot, 3%. And the rental stress is 68%, 3,000. Investor stress, 10%. And in terms of next three years, 8% bullish on houses, 9% bearish on houses. So somewhere between that range. Units somewhere between six um, bullish or down seven. 
for bearish. And I would say that some of the Western Australian situation will be determined, I think, by what happens once the borders, if they get opened as well. So I've had to make some assumptions about that. Um, but nevertheless, there is a little bit of um, sleeping pressure. And interestingly, uh, one of the things I have noticed is quite a lot of the um, rentals in Western Australia, they've tried to put the rents up. And so that's one of the reasons why we're starting to see um, higher levels of rental stress in, in the area. Now, Logan made an interesting question. A good statistic would be how many people are in a debt trap. So define the debt trap is, of course, the, the, the question. Um, so if you um, think about it, um, I look at it in cash flow terms, right? So that's driven by debt plus everything else. Now, there are other people who look at it in terms of multiples of income, so six times, seven times, right? I do have that data. I don't find it highly predictive in terms of some of the difficulties that I'm seeing. Um, we've also got um, you know, LVR ratios and things which don't tell us much. So it's interesting to question the debt trap. And the debt trap really has two elements. Ability to service the interest payments. That's a function of interest rates and income. And the ability to repay the capital. Bearing in mind, of course, that many people are interest only or um, are just uh, are expecting to eventually repay the mortgage from capital growth down the, down the track. I do remind people that when they take out a mortgage, it is not sufficient just to worry about servicing the interest flow. You need to think about how you're going to repay the capital over time. And I know the banks will be quite happy if you took 50 years to pay it off or never paid it off, as long as you go on paying those rental streams, because that's what you're doing. You're basically renting your property, even if you've got a mortgage, to the bank, from the bank. And if you go on paying, you know, they'll give you the extended mortgage and whatever and, you know, refinance, etc. Because all they want is your cash flow. That's all they want. They don't want you to pay it off. But what I say to people is, just remember that what you want and what the bank want, wants might be a bit different. So just bear that in mind. <laughs> um, I assume that's a comment, uh, Adam, about um, getting postcodes requests. Um, I um, no, I don't. If, if I see them, I'll put them up. Um, there's a lot of stuff in this in the in the chat going on. I have to work through it, and uh, you know, I'm probably a bit behind where uh, some of the. Um, uh, chat messages are but uh, I'll work my way through it as best I can and if I don't get your postcode on the show tonight you can send me a message via the DFA blog and I will then come back to you and I'll send you the information after the show over the next two or three days that's just a, a promise so you don't think you're going to miss out if you don't get the answer tonight um, just contact me and I'll try and, uh, and I'll try and help and I will just acknowledge um, Jason. Thank you very much for your super chat. Great, greatly appreciated. Um, doing pretty well. I hope you are too. And thank you very much for the super chat. And also, um, ADV Mark said, "Can I check out six oh five six? Thank you for the super chat. Now, did I do that one? No, I don't. Don't think I did. So let me just put that one up for you. Thank you very much. And, um, you know, the super chat is a way of getting getting to the top of the list. Um, but I do try and work through them in order of ask as best able I can. OK. OK, so I'm going to take that off. Thank you very much again for the super chat. And I'll switch across to here. OK, so this is 6056, 17,000 household 7700 borrowing 7200 renting so interesting roughly similar 5400 properties to rent 5200 rental property owners in the area 38 percent in financial stress mild stress 2300 that's 30 percent so that's not too bad slightly higher default rates at four percent interestingly default rates in wa have tended to be higher because of the very long grind over the last 10 years or so in property over there rental stress is at 40 percent 2,896 and 26 of investors are having difficulty of which 24 are severe stressed and in terms of uh, ahead about nine percent plus for houses over three years is my bullish case my bearish case is 
around 8.9 or 9 percent down over three years for units seven percent higher through to six percent lower so you know a little bit of leeway there but that's uh, roughly what i'm seeing at the moment so uh, thank you very much again for the uh, the super chat this is greatly appreciated and every dollar that comes in through super chat goes to help um, make more shows because none of this comes for free well it may come to free to you but it costs it costs for us to do it so mm. okay um now three five zero zero said script easy so let's try three five double o shall we three five zero zero mildura okay and I should say that some of these, of course, um, are going to be impacted by um, lockdowns and things. So I try to take into account all of the cash flows coming in, if they've been receiving payments from the government, etc., etc. That's all in the model as well. 15,000 households there, 4,700 borrowing, 7,700 renting, 5,800 properties for rent and 3,000 rental property owners. 20% in financial stress. 21% in mortgage stress at 996. Default rates at 2%, that's pretty low. Rental stress at 21%, 1,600. And investors at 15%, 425, of which 37 are severely stressed. In terms of the expectation, 11% over three years bullish case for houses, or down 7% bearish case over three years. For units, bullish of 8% higher, through to 5% fall over the next three years, depending on circumstances. So I hope that was helpful. Uh, this is one from Spooked Lee 6065. 6065. Let's try and get that in there. 6065. Okay. WA6065. Hocking. One of my tapping. One of my favourite uh, suburbs in terms of uh, dealing with stress. Okay. So 22,000 households, 15,100 borrowing, 6,000 renting, 4,700 properties for rent, 5,000 property rental owners, 61% in financial stress overall. Mortgage stress is at 69%. That's very high, at 10,435. Default rates are 4% over the next 12 months. Rental stress is at 45%. 2,835 households impacted. Investor stress is at 10%, of which a few of them, 62, are severely stressed, and the rest are um, just stressed. So there's an interesting, and that's obviously linked to the higher issue with rental stress there. In terms of growth, 8% bullish over the next three years or fall of 10% over three years, depending on which scenario you go with. 6% um, higher for units or down 7% over three years. Okay, whoops. Do that one. Four five five one. I think that might be a new one. Let's put that one in. Oh, that's better. Okay, four five five one. Caloundra, Moffat Beach, Pelican Water, Shelley Beach. I know the area well actually. Been there quite a few times. Okay, 26,600 households, 8,000 borrowing, 12,000 renting, 9,300 properties for rent, 9,800 rental property owners. Just to explain, the rental property owners mean that they live there, doesn't mean that they've got a rental property there, right? 
and that's why those two numbers are different. 48% in financial stress, 2,700 in mild mortgage stress, 33%, default rate at 3%, rental stress at 56%, 6,866, and 40% in investor stress. And in terms of um, scenarios, 12%, 30% bullish case over three years, bearish case down 5% over three years for houses, units up 9% or down 4% for bearish cases over three years. So I hope that's of some use. Um, what else have we got? <laughs> Just to picking up that point from Matt, cold supply went from two day stock to 16 day stock. Um, bit, um, suspect, yeah, well, they opened up a whole bunch of new um, uh, facilities in China to help try and deal with the um, issue. And of course, that's one of the issues going back to COP26 and everything else. Um, you know, lots of extra mining to get the coal out to get the power to drive the economy is going to actually have emissions issues. So it's a bit of a tricky situation. Um, I'm not sure how much of the information is um, fully transparent either, which is another very important question. OK, what else have I got? OK, interesting question, European resistance. Do you have a view on whether the Reserve Bank of New Zealand is about to raise interest rates in New Zealand again. Very interesting question. That don't know whether you did you see Adrian Orr's presentation today. It's worth looking at. It's a really interesting presentation. He basically warned people not to put all their investment risks in the property basket. <laughs> Which I mean, diversification is important. I think, and I've always said that. As you know, risks are everywhere in investing. Um, but it's interesting that the Reserve Bank uh, government was giving financial advice. <laughs> I'm not sure whether that's a good thing or not. And the other thing that he was talking about was the fact that um, they're not going to use interest rates to control house prices. But the markets are expecting more price hikes. A lot of the banks have put interest rates up because the margins are being compressed. Um, now, whether that will be sufficient to stop the Reserve Bank of New Zealand moving again or whether they will move again, I think um, it's line ball at the moment, and uh, I got the sense from Major Renault today that he was more like trying to talk the market in the direction he wanted without actually doing anything. Now, if that's the case, we might see New Zealand just sort of hanging around a bit before they move again, but ultimately rates will go higher. And of course, even the, even the Reserve Bank doesn't move again, mortgage rates are already moving higher, and a lot of people in New Zealand are highly leveraged, in fact, more leveraged than Australia in, in some areas. So this is a real issue for the um, New Zealand property sector. And as I mentioned earlier on, there was also that research this week that showed there was an equilibrium between supply and demand. In other words, uh, population growth versus uh, construction of property. So there isn't an undersupply of property. Put that in the mix as well. Higher interest rates, tighter lending standards. And you would expect, I think, to see prices beginning to come off their highs as, as, as they are. Momentum probably easing. Uh, I saw some uh, data that some auctions had actually come off the boil as well in terms of numbers and of course prices ease back in some areas as well so the whole New Zealand property market having gone through a huge boom created by the Reserve Bank of New Zealand is now sort of coming back to rest a little bit um, I think all will wait to see how this plays out before he moves the dial again but ultimately I think he will probably have to move the rate higher OK, Nick asked for Lawn System. 7250, sure can. A place that I've been to a few times. Very pleasant area. OK, Lawn System, there we go. 21,000, 22,000 households, 8,000 borrowing, 9,000 renting, 6,800 properties for rent, and 49% in financial stress. 61% in mortgage stress, so that's a problem. It's a big number. 5,000 or so in mortgage stress, 
51% in rental stress, 4,627% of investors in difficulty. And this is the problem in some of these uh, Tasmanian suburbs. We're seeing people having to overcommit to try and get a property. So they've got these big mortgages. Incomes are very compressed at the moment, not a lot of um, uh, momentum. And so that's creating huge, huge issues. In terms of uh, the case, 7% bullish over three years. Interesting, a bit of a peak and then a, a runaway. Um, or down 11% over three years is what the modelling is saying. For units, up 5%, down 8%, the bearish case. So that gives you a bit of a flavour of where things may be heading. Um, come back to that. Whoops, go there. Yeah, interesting question from uh, from Matt there about the FOMC meeting. Um, I think they will probably be signalling quite strongly that they are going to taper. Question is, when will they? Um, the latest data, I'll come back to that in a second, actually. I've got some data I might share with you in a, in a, in a moment or two um, on what's happening in the US, because, in fact, some of the data is looking pretty weak. And so they might be looking at this data and thinking, maybe we should just... Um, you know, had a little bit of a hold on things. I don't know. I'll have to wait and see. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see something being uh, out the back of the meeting this time. A lot, a lot of the other Fed leaders, of course, have been saying, do stuff, do stuff. Powell has been very dovish. Bank of England is also, of course, meeting this week as well, and uh, potentially they might cut rates as well. So, uh, sorry, lift rates, I should say. Um, so it looks to me as though the um, theatre of movement has changed tempo. We'll see. Uh, OK, let's have a look. <laughs> I hope it was your MBN cable and not mine that uh, got knocked out, <laughs> the cookie boy, because I'm still transmitting as far as I can tell from here. <laughs> My... Um, uh, a report on the uh, YouTube studio saying that we are um, still transmitting, so I uh, hope you fixed it. Don't you just hate that when, they, when the cable drops out? Okay. Uh, here's a question. Asking for two, 4210. We'll go start with that then. Forty one zero. Okay. Forty one zero. Seven thousand households, four thousand three hundred borrowing, two thousand three hundred renting, twenty six percent in financial stress, thirteen percent in mortgage stress at five hundred and fifty eight. 37% in rental stress, 881, 28% in investor stress. So it's relatively benign. And the 14 to 15% bullish case over three years, or bearish case of around 3.5% down. For houses, units 10% versus 2.6%. And you asked for another one as well, 2463. So I'll just do that. Two four two four six three. Okay, two four six three. Um, three thousand five hundred households. This is places like Broomshead, McLean. Thousand borrowing, one thousand two hundred renting, nine hundred and fifty properties for rent. And 51% in financial stress overall, so a bit higher. 25% in mortgage stress, 262. 93% in rental stress, so rentals is the issue here. And that also translates into pressure on investors at 43%, with 333 stressed investors and 77% of those, of 77 of those, I should say, in severe stress. In terms of price movements, 4% over the three years is my bullish case. My bearish case is down 13%. For units, up 3% and down 10% over three years. OK, so let me now just go back to the end of my presentation. I had a few other slides and then I'll come back and do a few more 
our postcodes towards the end of the show. And let me just go there and bring that back up. Okay. So just a few more things I wanted to touch on. Um, going, I mentioned the US. So the Fed's favourite inflation gauge, the PCE, is looking like um, it's definitely a bit sick. And bearing in mind it's the highest in three decades, um, well, the month to month did fall a little bit. So some really conflicting data there. Um, but the trimmed mean, which is what the Dallas Fed does, is really highlighting that it's breaking out. And essentially what it's saying is that it's really, um, you know, 1980 time. So that's a big deal. And also the other point in the US, labour is growing more expensive. And so if you look at it, and that's partly wage rises and having to hire more expensive to get people to get in. Amazon's paying a lot more than they were previously for jobs, for example. So those factors combined would suggest to me that the Fed is going to need to react in its meeting. And I think that's why I believe the tapering is more likely to happen than not. Timing, of course, to be confirmed. And what they've basically said is they'll taper first and then think about rate rises later. We'll see. Um, it will be a really interesting test as to what happens with the markets and what happens with the economy if they start pulling away some of that stimulus. Because, of course, the markets are overvalued by massive amount because of all the stimulus. So uh, although somebody in the chat earlier on said, well, it got through October, so, you know, it's going to be another year. It may not be another year. We might start to see the markets begin to sort of... Uh, um, correct or not. We'll see. So many uncertain things um, there at the moment. So it is very difficult to uh, be able to make a, a, a call on all of those things. Um, and just I will go on just to say um, in my closing slides and then I'll come back and do some more postcodes and questions at, right at the end. Um, if you want more information about um, uh, what we do and the Walk the World Fund in particular, which is my current collaboration with Nucleus Wealth, go to walktheworld.com.au. Uh, go to the DFA blog if you want more information, if you want to send me a message, um, if you've got a postcode you want me to uh, uh, answer you on, um, you can do that via the DFA blog. There's um, uh, contact details there and also um, you can use the live chat facility there um, and I'll get to it when I can. Uh, you can support our work on Patreon. Um, there are a range of tiers. I've got a number of different uh, offerings there, you know, the full data set through to the monthly series like I've been showing you today, access to that online tool so that you can basically um, play the um, analysis any way you want. And uh, it also allows you to run different scenarios and things like that as well. Uh, so that's available. And the 50 US, or about 65 Aussie, um, per month plus GST is the full access to all of the tools, some of which I've been showing you tonight on the um, on the web uh, there, on the web portal, which basically looks at things like mortgage stress and uh, the, 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 the scenarios in terms of price. And what it allows you to do, of course, is to compare different locations and sort of look at a number of different dimensions. We're also working on things like uh, gross and net rental yield, which we do have in the model. We haven't yet exposed it uh, out there, but that's also planned uh, when we've got time. As I said at the start, we've got a few other things on at the minute, so um, things are a bit slower than we'd like. Uh, you can support us via PayPal also, by the way. Some people do that, and it's greatly appreciated. Um, every dollar that's um, thrown our way gets uh, to be invested in more content and, uh, and shows. None of it actually goes into uh, uh, anybody's back pocket. Uh, or indeed Bitcoin. We still have a QR code up. And uh, so that allows people to throw Bitcoin if they want to. Um, it's more valuable than it was, so uh, we'll see. And uh, there's also some merch as well, which I don't really push very hard, but it is available. A few people have uh, gone for that over the years. And I will just say that next week I've got um, another really important conversation with Adam Stokes on. Um, and it's framed around this concept, did crypto just go mainstream? And the reason why I want this conversation is because we've had in the last week ASIC publishing a whole series of documents about the regulation of the crypto markets in Australia. And we had a report from the government with regards to um, 
the future of cryptos and you know a bunch of other rules and regulations around how crypto operations in Australia will be taxed, how they'll be um, moderated and all those sorts of things. So I wanted to go through some of that and try and go beyond the sort of the Bitcoin conversation into what is the sort of evolution of crypto and how is it, if, is it going to go mainstream, what does it look like and what are some of the barriers that are being thrown up from the regulators. So that's what that conversation is, is about. So Mike Kidari for the 9th, Adam Stokes will be joining me for that. Adam, of course, as you know, um, very bullish towards um, crypto, but he and I have some interesting chats when we get going. So hopefully that will be uh, worth it. And I will just say that the following week, so the week after the 9th, the following week, um, Steve Keen will be on live and we'll be able to pick his brains about some of the um, political issues and some of the um, financial issues that are confronting us in Australia at the moment. Okay, so with that, it's 9.27, so um, those who need to get away, um, <laughs> you're dismissed if you need to get away. Um, I really appreciate your um, hanging with us through the uh, hour and a half or so. For those who'd like to stay a little longer, I uh, will do a f another quick skip down the questions. Um, I've got one here. Uh, let's go there. Um, so North Wanderer, good name that North. Um, let's do three nine oh four and thank you for the super chat. Three nine oh four. Let's put that there first. Okay. So three nine oh four. Here we go. So this is quite a um, small count, 986 households, of which 217 are borrowing, 493 are renting, and 371 properties for rent, 29% in financial stress, 50% in mortgage stress, so a small number, but a significant. Remember what I said about percentages being a, could be misleading, right? So it can be a small count, but a high percentage. And uh, that can sometimes give a bit of a misleading impression when you see it on a map. 33% in rental stress, 21% in investor stress. And in terms of predictions based on the model, bullish case of 9% over three years, bearish case of 9% over three years, so somewhere between that. And for houses, or 7% uh, versus 6.8% down uh, for bearish cases over the next three years. So that's that one. Um, Tang says, I still think massive correction won't happen because of what the Gov did last during the, during the pandemic. They'll at one point freeze transactions. Well, you're certainly right. I think the government will intervene again. They'll use taxpayers' money again. The RBA will throw more cheap money at the banks Again, those are all scenarios that we've actually got to um, a countenance, and that could be uh, putting a bit of a flaw. That's why my scenarios are, you know, a little bit broad in terms of what may happen. Um, I'm almost certain that's what they'll try to do. The question is, how long, much longer can they go on doing that? Right? Bear in mind the amount of debt that's piling up. The Reserve Bank has not got enough capital now to cover its commitments ahead if rates move. I covered that in the post yesterday. And so they may, may need to grab capital from the government, from the Treasury, to be able to actually um, support the activities of the Reserve Bank. And I also believe very firmly that there needs to be an inquiry into the f functioning of the Reserve Bank and its efficacy, because they've basically been all over the place for the last few years on this. And um, whilst they try to sort of put a spin wrapper around it and say everything's fine and we know exactly what they're doing, um, a lot of uh, analysts are saying, we're not sure... <laughs> We're not sure we know what the Reserve Bank is doing. We're not sure whether the Reserve Bank knows what it's doing. And their forecasting has been um, pretty shoddy. So um, we'll see. But um, in terms of freezing transactions, that's probably unlikely. Um, it is a concern, of course, that um, the property sector has really expanded to be the main game in town. And uh, what that means is that investment isn't flowing towards other sectors where it should be. And that's the problem that I have. So we'll see how that flows out. 
Uh, and Harmit says um, RBA may not ever increase interest rates. Do they have to increase interest rates? Is there a mandate? Uh, well, they've basically got a mandate. The mandate is a full employment, uh, looking after the exchange rate, and uh, the greater well-being of Australians. That's basically their mandate, right? Um, they don't have a house price mandate. They use interest rates as a tool. It's not a sort of a, you must put the rates up, right? But it is the, the main tool they use. The problem is, is interest rates a good tool or not in the current environment? My own view is that what we're seeing is a lot of um, evidence that this interest rate manipulation that they've tried has really not worked at all well. Um, but that's what the Reserve Bank's mandate is. Of course, there's a separate mandate that APRA has with regard to financial stability and the stability of the banks. The banks would be highly exposed if property prices fell or if rates went up. So those would give grounds to suggest that there is a limited amount of wriggle room for the rates to rise. And that's one of the reasons why the Reserve Bank is continuing to say later, later, later. Right? But the markets are saying sooner, sooner, sooner. And as I showed you earlier on, those uh, uh, yield curve charts were suggesting that rates will be higher you know, in the next year or so. So too soon to know precisely how this is going to play out. But the last thing they want to do, the very last thing, will be to crash the housing market. And yet um, every bubble, every housing bubble around the world pretty much, has ultimately crashed. We just haven't seen it here for a long, long time. I've been in the UK previously. I saw it there. I've seen it in other countries too. So in the end, the question is, can they go on doing this? Can they go on fixing up yet more ways of trying to keep the bubble going? Right? And that's really the unknown question. I'm sure they can give more first-time grants. They can give 100% loans. They can buy back bad properties off the banks. All those things are in, you know, in, in the bailiwick. At some point, though, you've got to ask... Where is fair value on property? Because it's not where we've got at the moment. We've got massively overvalued property. It's higher relative to income, higher relative to GDP, higher than most other countries. And actually, it's sucking all the air out of the room. The right answer would be to let house prices settle and focus on investing elsewhere. That's the challenge. Not sure whether the Reserve Bank's up for it, though. OK. Um, style play said... 297. I'm now running on overtime. That's okay. I'll go on for another five minutes or so. So um, I don't like to disappoint those who've um, stayed with me and are hoping to see the um, um, stress numbers and things. Uh, do what I can. So let's just whoops, push that button and then get rid of that button. There you go. OK, uh, 5,600 in 2097, this is Collaroy. 2,600 borrowing, 1,800 renting, 1,400 properties of rent, and a lot of property investors that are living up there. 36% in financial stress, that's a bit lower than some. 5% in default, though, that's quite high. 9% in mortgage stress. 36% in rental stress at 679. And 51% of investors stressed. And it's worth highlighting this. The default rate is not directly correlated with stress. People can live in stress for a long, long time, but ultimately may have issues. But other issues come on over the top, like, for example, business failure. And in this area, there are a lot of independent businesses who are close to the wind at the moment. So that's one of the reasons why the uh, default rate's quite high. Um, in terms of property prices, the bullish case about 7% over three years, the bearish case down 11% from, from now. For units 5% higher or 8% lower is what I'm looking at over that period of time. <laughs> Interesting observation from Matt saying the RBA has one mandate, control inflation. It sort of is, but it, as I said earlier on, it's a bit more complicated than that. They've got this well-being thing and they've got this um, 2 to 3% ban thing, right? And... That's become a proxy for what they're actually trying to do. So it is quite interesting. I don't know. Reserve banks. I think we can get rid of them. OK. Botany, please, said ITCM. Oops. Go there, go there, go there. There we go. OK. 
2019 botany okay here we come 4,100 households, 1,900 borrowing, 1,800 renting, 1,400 properties for rent, and 59% in financial stress. Mortgage stress at 42%, 795 properties, 2% default. Rental stress is very high at 73%, and mortgage stress amongst investors is high at 44%, including 229 in severe stress. In terms of um, modelling, 4.5% bullish case over three years for houses or down 13% is what we're seeing at the moment. For units, up 3% or down 10%. Okay, well, I think that's pretty much as far as we're going to go. Uh, we'll just see. Yeah. Yogi Bear asked. Oops. Go there. Does the model consider prepayments? Yes, it does. Offsets. It got it's got all that data. Um Jason says, love your work. I'll stream it. Yep. <laughs> Smooth operator. <laughs> Comment on oh system. Yeah, it's probably right. Um Chris says Swan Hill. Oh, uh, all right then. Three, five, eight, five. Three, five, eight, five. Okay. Here we go. Three, five, eight, five. Through the chat so you can see it. 5,000 households, 1,500 borrowing, 2,400 renting, 1,800 properties for rent, 19% in rental stress, pretty low, 47% in mortgage stress, 3% defaults, 5% in rental stress, 7% in investor stress. So that's why they're 19% so low. So there's a bit of mortgage stress, but not a lot. Valuations over three years, up 11% bullish case, down 7% bearish case. For units up eight percent or down five percent. Interesting question here. <laughs> Is the investor stress based on where the person lives or where the house they own as the investment is located? Well, Obviously, quite often, investors live in the same place as they actually have the property. So that's not an issue. Where they actually have property elsewhere, um, that's included. So that's why I always show the number of rental property owners separate from the um, numbers of properties for rent. But um, quite a few people um, live in one place and rent in the same place. Others are different, so that's the way it works. But it's the overall footprint of the investor. So it's not a uniform one-to-one -one match <laughs> smooth says the fed is so scared it will never taper cookie says any commercial real estate news i should do a commercial real estate show actually i've got a whole bunch of information um on that vincent says negative rates are on the cards it could well be i still think it could well be um uh, significant yeah very significant Uh, glad to help. Uh, another one, Willoughby, 2068, says NA. 2068. Yep. Okay. Just get rid of the chat and show that up. There we go. So 6,200 households, 2,600 borrowing, 2,000 renting, 1,500 properties for rent, 40% in financial stress. Mortgage stress is 27%, which includes 407 severe stressed, 304 mild stressed. Default rates are 3%. 37% in rental stress and 50% of investors stressed, including 177 severely stressed. 
Price movements up 6.5% over three years. Bullish for houses, down 11% over three years. Under the bearish scenario for units, up 4% or down 8%. Right. Okay. Glad to help. Thanks, Bondi Steve. Appreciate it. And uh, here you go. Bob says, I remember your chats with Nugget. Yes, um, no, no, he's gone off the radar. So I'm afraid that um, at the moment, no chance. But if he comes back, always happy to have a conversation. Thanks to Jason. Cheerio. And Cookie says, thank you. And for the four-legged creatures. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the, the girls were actually asleep most of the time. Good night to you all. And um, um, I hope that uh, we can pick up the conversation next time. I'm going to give up here. So if you didn't get your postcode answered and you want it, just go to the DFA blog, send me your um, request, and I will turn it around over the next few days. Um, I think there's a limit to how, how far I can go on. Um, and, you know, I have to say that um, with everything, and thanks very much for Super Chats, uh, as always, it really is appreciated. Um, thank you all for your time tonight and for all of your questions. Oh, sorry I didn't get to all of them, but I, <laughs> I never do. And uh, unfortunately, there's a limit to uh, how long we can go on this. So I wish you well, keep safe, and... Uh, Come and visit us again next week when we talk crypto and in two weeks' time with um, Steve Keen talking economics and all those good things. So I'll look forward to seeing you then. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off. We'll see you next time. Cheerio.